Good morning, everybody. Come on, give me a little more love than that, will you, please? Yeah, All right, thank that, you. Can we, like, even... Like, uh, it, it is wonderful to be back with Lance, uh, Cobalt Banker, uh, talk a little about things. Uh, of course, a couple of years ago, we were forced to be at a studio. It is so wonderful to be back live again, to say the very least. Uh, we have too much to talk about over the next hour or so. So with that, uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, the big news, of course, coming into this year, we're going to have a recession. Well, so we've heard, right? Uh, now, uh, what do you have to say about this? Uh, you know, it, it's how many times have we had to deal with this exact same headline over the last decade since I've been doing this event, right? Uh, the nattering nabobs of negativism are at it again. And of course, this is about the time where I roll out my, uh, 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 oops, there we go, oops, there we go. This is about the point in time where I roll out my, uh, my famous, uh, or infamous as the case may be, uh, miserable as a blind. Uh, as you know, uh, my conversation about our national attitude over the last decade is that it has been one of negatism, of miserableism, where no matter how good the data is, uh, we have to tell, turn around and tell each other exactly how awful it is, right? We have to come up with all the excuses in the world as to why all this data can be pushed to one side, and why really, when you get right down to it, things are still truly tragic. Well, look. I got a little different shtick now, and it's different because of a book I read not too long ago. This thing really isn't working very well. I have to kind of, oops, hang on, maybe I'm hitting the wrong. Guys, you got to help me out here. I'm next to the stage here, and it's not working. There we go. Um, is this thing, do you have battery? I don't know what's going on with this thing. Um, Apparently, it's not, not comfortable. All right, so, uh, so uh, my whole attitude sort of changed on this a couple years ago. I read this book, uh, uh, Narrative Economics. Of course, Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner, you might remember he wrote a book many years ago called uh, Irrational Exuberance. Oh, by the way, I see some people already tilting their cameras out. There's a new system involved here. At the very end of my presentation, you're going to have a QR code. When the QR code pops up, use your phone then, take a picture of the QR code, and you will get a set of these slides mailed to you. All right? So... You can hang on to that when it gets to you. Um, so again, uh, Robert Schiller, Irrational Exuberance, new book, and in this book, of course, Narrative Economics. It's actually a very profound book, although it's a great read, buy it on Amazon, definitely worth picking up. What's interesting about this book, it really is, if you will, a finger being pointed at the economics community. Now look, deep at the heart of economics is a fundamental truth that a lot of economists have forgotten about, and that is, is a social science. It's about human beings. But economists, in many ways, have gotten so fond of their mathematics and so fond of their numbers that they have almost forgotten about the human at the bottom of this thing. And by the way, you can't forget about that. That's exactly what this whole book is about. And the point here, of course, is, you know, over the years, economists who have this excessive technical, shall we say, way of thinking about the world have struggled to explain business cycles. They shouldn't exist in this world of rational agents, not in the way we think. And so there's all sorts of ways that economists try to, if you will, stumble into explaining recessions from a technical standpoint. The whole point here is this, is, is the idea that we're number-based creatures is ridiculous. Human beings are inherently narrative-based creatures. And the argument here is, listen, in the last 150 years, we have data, we have computers, we have economic modeling. But if you go back to dawn of civilization and ask what binds human beings together, of course, the answer is the stories we tell each other. The core of human civilization are the stories we tell each other. Now, if the stories and the narrative line up well, if the, I'm sorry, if the narrative and the reality lines up well, things are fine. This is the world in which households make good decisions, businesses make good decisions, policymakers pursue the right goals. This is a good world. The problem is, is this world doesn't always exist. Sometimes, of course, the narrative becomes completely off base from the reality. And this, of course, is at the core of real business cycles. Because it is at this point in time where the stories we tell ourselves are so much different than the reality that households start making bad decisions, businesses start making bad decisions, policymakers start pursuing the wrong goals. And again, bad things happen when this is going on. Now, of course, I've described the last decade as miserableism, one in which the narrative has been one of constant decline despite how good the data is. On the other side of the fence, if you go back before the Great Recession, it's the other way around. For example, does anybody remember in 1998, where if you had a lousy business plan, 
You still have dot com on the end of it, suddenly it's worth $10 billion. Remember that, right? Nice. Or how about in 2005, where anybody with a bunch of pick and pay subprime loans could become a real estate millionaire overnight? And of course, the banks had a wonderful narrative. You could take all that subprime debt, stack it up in asset backed security, and sell 85% of the proceeds in the form of, of course, ultra safe, triple A, gold plated, pension worthy bonds. Obviously, broken narratives, broken narratives that inevitably led to, of course, uh, downturns in the economy. Now, one of the things I would love to tell you here is, of course, that economists are firmly rooted in reality, right? Yeah, not so much. Unfortunately, there's a lot of economists all over the map here, okay? Some narratives are out there trying to tell you the reality. There's a lot of economists out there simply selling you the narrative. Um, I, why? Well, it's a very simple rule here. It's easier to sell an existing narrative than it is to create a new one out of reality. It's easier to just go with the flow in so many different ways. But unfortunately, going with the flow means, of course, you're promoting the false narratives, which ends up, of course, overall hurting our world around us. So it, it's a problem. It is always a problem. By the way, which economists are selling your reality and which ones are selling your narrative? I'll let you figure that out. That's kind of on you. So uh, there's no doubt coming into 2023, we've had some mixed signals. Obviously, we had a big slowdown in economic growth over the course of 2022, a big decline in, in the consumer sentiment. Uh, of course, you had uh, the yield curve going negative. Uh, and as you know, if you're into numerology, if the yield curve is inverted, this is a very good sign that we're going to have a recession. Now, to me, this is correlation, not causation, ergo. It doesn't mean anything else by itself. And I don't think we're going to have a recession if I need to preface things uh, just a little bit here. Last bit of new news, of course, is over the course of this week, we're suddenly in the midst of a big banking crisis. You're dealing with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, of Signature Bank, and we know as of this morning, there are all sorts of banks in similar problems. On the other hand, can we also agree something else? No matter how bad the news might be right now, the economy is clearly not in a recession right now. A recession is a period of time where the economy is not living up to its full potential to produce goods and services. Our unemployment rate in the United States right now is 3.4%. Everybody who wants a job has a job, period. This is not an economy that has, shall we say, slack in the system. Industrial production is at an all-time, or nearly an all-time high level. This is an economy booming forward. And of course, if you take a look at Q1, well, Q1's coming in at probably somewhere between 1% and 2% growth. So clearly, this is not the quarter we tip into this so-called recession. So where are we heading? One more. Uh, the narrative, of course, is the recession is nigh. Why is it nigh? Well, first of all, we have to start with the basic idea. The economy's already in a recession. Why is it already in a recession? Depends on what party you belong to. One side of the fence will tell you it's taxes and regulations. The other side of the fence will tell you it's housing costs and inequality. Me personally, I think they're all out to lunch. I don't think the economy is currently in crisis. But if you start with that standpoint, then you add, of course, the big news stories of 2022 to the forefront. Obviously, a big surge in inflation, a big surge in interest rates. And the story goes, inflation is crushing consumers. And of course, interest rates are crushing uh, 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 in real estate. And the failure of these banks is simply a sign of the rot at the heart of the beast. Reality, we're not going to have a recession in the next couple of years. In fact, I think there's only one person in this country who can cause a recession in the next couple of years, and his name is Jerome Powell. Otherwise, the economy's fine. Look, inflation and rising interest rates are not negative shocks coming out of nowhere. These are basically, <laughs> when you get right down to it, these are nothing more than the symptoms of the excessive stimulus that was deployed in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, as for the economy itself, well, look, if you really want to talk about a recession hitting the economy, you have to start with what is the real imbalance? Where is the real decline in demand going to come from? I look across our economy today, and I don't see any major imbalances. I don't see any potential recession-causing events on our short-run uh, timeline. There's no doubt, of course, some interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy, such as real estate, are going to struggle until they re-equilibrate around these higher rates. On the other hand, consumer spending and business investment should more than offset the overall problems for the economy created in the real estate. 
Asset prices, including homes, almost assuredly will continue to slowly deflate, but the fundamentals are just fine. And remember, you know, even if home prices went down 15%, guess what? They're still 30% higher than they were three years ago. In other words, there's a lot of room for asset prices to come down but without it having any kind of significant impact. And of course, banking issues are being caused almost exclusively by no one other than the Federal Reserve itself. The banking system is just fine. Now, with all that in mind, does that mean everything's fine? Of course not. There are stresses and strains on our economy today. For example, one of them is when you take mortgage rates from 2.5% to 7%, you collapse what economists call filtering, which is how most housing is delivered. You build at the top to supply at the bottom. Well, because no one's going to be selling their house when they're locked in at a 2.7% mortgage rate, guess what? You're going to have a collapse in filtering, and that's going to make the housing shortage worse. Labor shortages are an enormous problem for the entire United States, and we haven't really even begun this conversation. We have public deficit challenges at the state and federal level. We have the potential and pointless bank credit crisis going on right now. But to me, the biggest problem in our country remains the enormous gap between the narrative and the reality, between the stories we tell ourselves and what we should understand when we look at the core data that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So where do we get here? Well, miserableism, right? Go back a few years and we all heard these insanely negative headlines. They're worth looking right now, right? A coronavirus is gonna cause the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Zandi says 30% of Americans with home loans are gonna stop paying. Uh, 30 to 40 million people in America are gonna be evicted. In the end, it turned out to be 30 to 40. Um, you know. <laughs> It's crazy, right? Make no mistake, the pandemic has morphed into a depression-like crisis. Oh, I wanted to take that guy and put him in a time machine. Back to 1931. Here's a real depression, Chief. See what it really looks like. I mean, obviously nonsensical. What ended up happening? Not much, right? You can say all you want, but look, it was the deepest recession we've ever had. It was the shortest as well. And you came roaring back, and you know, this may come up a little later, the shapes. To me, that looks kind of like a V, just saying, just saying. But here's the point, here is the real issue. We lost about $1.2 trillion in economic output. That's it, it wasn't all that much because it wasn't that serious of a recession. It was a different kind of recession. It didn't have the enormous consequences that say the collapse of the subprime double did for the economy back before the Great Recession. Ergo, we didn't really need all that much, but don't let reality intrude on a good narrative. Congress went crazy. Six trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus, six trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus was deployed to deal with a 1.2 trillion dollar shot to the economy. Five dollars in stimulus for every dollar of lost income. That's insanity. Now here's the key. How did they do that? You know, Congress was borrowing about a trillion dollars prior to the pandemic. How do you go to the bond markets and go, yeah, this year I need three trillion? You can't. In 2019, all debt in the United States expanded by about 3.5 trillion. Keep that in the back of your mind. All debt, I'm talking about housing and business and corporate, all the above expanded by 3.5 trillion. There's not that capacity in American debt markets to give Congress over $3 trillion of cash in one particular year. Had they tried to do that, they would have blown up the bond markets, they would have never gotten the cash, and all those plans would have fallen to the wayside. Good news is, they didn't have to go to the bond market. They just went to Jerome. And lo and behold, Jerome Powell just stepped up right to the plate, said, hey, you need cash? I got cash for you. $5 trillion in quantitative easing. Now understand what happened when you say that. What happened is this. Jerome Powell showed up to the, to the Capitol Hill with $5 trillion in brand new cash. He handed it to Congress and they fire hosed it across the economy. We have never seen such a crazy injection of cash into our economy. And, you know, to be clear, you might say, hey, Brent Bernanke did it. I mean, he just won the Nobel Prize. Can't be that bad, right? Nah. You know, every tool has to be the right tool for the job. Look, you've got to understand, there was an enormous difference between what Ben Bernanke was facing and what Jerome Powell was facing. 
Like, if you really want to know what causes a depression, the answer is not a pandemic. No pandemic has ever caused a depression. This is understood. What causes a depression is deflation. A bad recession combined with deflation. Deflation, of course, is caused by the decline in the money supply. Well, that depression typically takes place when there's some sort of big problem in the banking system. Because when the banking system starts to fold, that creates deflationary pressures on the economy. So if the recession destabilizes bankings, watch out. Now, Ben Bernanke is a student of history. He understands this, and he says, I'm not going to let this happen. And he deployed $3.5 trillion of quantitative easing carefully over six years to deal with the deflationary pressures of the banking sector that was an enormous amount of crisis. Right now, by the way, over the last couple of years, banking sector hasn't been in a crisis. In fact, my question for Jerome Powell, who just showed up with $5 trillion in brand new cash, is what were you doing? What crisis were you dealing with? There was no deflationary pressure. There was no financial markdown. There weren't foreclosures. There weren't bankruptcies. This crisis never arrived. The re result of this, of course, is very obvious. One of the greatest expansions in money supply the nation has ever seen since, of course, the Federal Reserve was created a little over 100 years ago. 40% increase in M2. 40% in two years. We've never seen anything like this. Now, what happens when you print too much money? Well, we know this from another book you can get on Amazon.com, Money Mischiefs by Milton Friedman. Again, an easy read. And by the way, to understand what happens, you don't even have to read past the first chapter. And the first, this is how well known this is. The first chapter, Milton Friedman lays it out. You expand the money supply by 40%, the first thing that happens, the economy takes off. Money illusion kicks in. Hey, we're rich, right? Everybody's got money. So they buy bonds and print interest rates go down. They buy stocks and asset prices go up. Home prices go through the roof. Consumers' spending goes up. Business investment takes off. Feels great. Kind of like it feels great after you bought a drink a half bottle of tequila, right? Here's the problem. It's not real. Real wealth is determined by the capacity for an economy to produce goods and services. That capacity is a function of real things. Infrastructure, workers, training, institutions that do the job they're supposed to do. This is the things that create real productivity. And it, if you throw a bunch of money at the economy, it doesn't change any of those things. It just puts a whole bunch of more money in the economy, and ultimately the only thing that does is push demand beyond the capacity for the economy to meet that demand. When you have more demand than supply, what happens? Prices go up. Boom! Suddenly, the tequila wears off when you wake up with the stimulus hangover. Suddenly, asset prices go down. Inflation starts to heat up. Interest rates start to heat up. And, of course, consumer spending cools off, business investment cool off. You end up exactly the same place you were to begin with. Nothing's changed, but there are some long-run consequences that Milton Friedman points out. One of the consequences is there's a sharp transfer of wealth from savers to, of course, borrowers. And investment risk rises in the long run, which is, again, bad for the economy. So the argument here is, you don't do this. You just don't do this willy-nilly. You actually achieve nothing in the short run, and you have negative consequences in the long run. But we did it anyway. So you can see it cl pretty clearly here. The big in spending binge, they throw all the money at the economy. The trade deficit starts to widen. You know, we all, heard all about these, these supply problems we have, these logistic problems we had. And there's no doubt the pandemic played some role in that. But let's acknowledge the bigger part of it was this, is our logistics system wasn't built for this sudden surge in demand. It just wasn't built for this. So the combination of the pandemic with the surge in demand completely created chaos. And of course, yes, prices went up. Had a huge surge of inflation, which was completely predictable. There is absolutely no surprise here. And it wasn't just the United States. Many central banks overdid it. Hence, inflation is a global phenomenon. What's funny, the surprise, none of this is a surprise. This is established, understood monetary theory. We get this. We have hundreds of years of good monetary data. We know you cannot expand the money supply 40% without creating inflation. What's hysterical, if you have a sense of humor, <laughs> is what the people in D.C. say about it. 
Uh, oh, he's going through them quicker than I am. I didn't say any of those. Anyway, you, you, got, you got, of course, uh, Janet Yellen comes out and says, well, we didn't anticipate the supply chain issues. Oh, there's a federal deficit, greedy corporations, not enough manufacturing jobs, Biden's bad green energy policies. You know, now both parties can agree. It's Putin's fault, all right? Now, the question you've got to ask yourself, what other nonsensical excuse are they going to come up with next? Saturn isn't aligned with Jupiter. Kim shouldn't have numbed Kanye. The Lakers are perimeter defense. I mean, really, these are all as legitimate of reasons for inflation as the top six. People, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. You cannot have a prolonged bout of inflation unless you have a prolonged bout of money supply expansion. Again, there is nothing here that is surprising, except for the fact that we can't acknowledge it. Why? Narratives. Remember, Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., 80% of people in this nation are living hand to mouth. They're living hand to mouth. They're one paycheck away from being homeless. And oh, by the way, it's all the fault of the other party's policies. This is it. This is politics in 2023. In that world, you cannot stand up and point out the obvious. Why do we have inflation? Because people are spending too much money. You're not allowed to say that. So, is the supply or demand? Well, let's talk about gasoline. <laughs> All right, take a look at this orange line here. The orange line is gasoline prices. There's no doubt gasoline prices went up a lot at the beginning of 2022. They went up by 50%. And oh, the hand-wringing and the existential crises and the, the pearl clutching we went through. Oh, it's tragic, it's terrible. But really? Was this just a giant supply shock that flattened Americans? Take a look at the bars there. This is vehicle miles driven in the United States. Pay close attention to that. If you have a 50% increase in the price of gasoline and it's just supply, what should happen to the quantity of gasoline purchased to the amount of miles we drive? Well, in my understanding of economics, it should go down. It didn't. It didn't go anywhere. All that increase in gasoline prices, and we just kept living our lives as if nothing was going on. That tells you something pretty important. This is not supply, it's demand. And who had to deal with this, this uh, newspaper, these, uh, TV news story? You know, the camera walks up to this guy in the gas station. Hey man, how do you feel about filling up your truck? Oh man, it's awful, it's terrible, so much money. Biden sucks, man, this is the worst. Oh, okay, thank you very much for your comments, sir. Back to you, Becky. You're like, no, no, stop. Time out, time out. Ask the next question. Where are you going, buddy? So, <laughs> so I mean, we, we, people are driving like crazy, giant cars that are having fun, and, and the problem is we're spending too much money, and Gavin Newsom gives us more money for it. Again, think of that. Just let that rattle around in your head. Now, how much farther can inflation go? Uh, that's a complicated question, uh, but basically you have to worry about real growth and how aggressive the Fed's going to be and what's going to happen to real velocity and so on and so forth. But the answer is we're only halfway through this. They had a 40% increase in the money supply. They've barely backed off that. We're halfway through this. We've got a long ways to go to get prices and the money supply and the economy back realigned. So we got a roadway in front of us. We have to. There are basic equilibrium issues here you have to deal with. So what's interesting is, of course, is how the Federal Reserve has dealt with this, right? Because they haven't dealt with it through quantitative tightening, trying to trake that $5 trillion back. In fact, they've just begun $5 trillion. They increased money supply by 40%. It's now down by a mere 4%. Most of their action has been cranking up the federal funds rate, which started at zero and now is approaching five. And, you know, what, what um, Jerome Powell about, told us about a week ago is even this isn't good enough. It was interesting because about a week ago, he, of course, this headline came out and he said, well, if you don't believe me, we're not going to have a recession, believe Jerome. Because it was a week ago, he's like, yeah, apparently price inflation is not slowing down. The economy isn't going to a recession. Ergo, we're going to have to crank rates up. Well, you know what that's done to the banking system. Well, what happened? Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. All right. Uh, what happened? Well, let me explain this to you. And I'm sorry. Apologies for some of the graphic problems here. Um, it basically, think of it this way, and Silicon Valley Bank is, is a wonderful example of this, right? Which is, 
um, a bank who was right in the center of Silicon Valley. So you put $5 trillion in the economy, it doesn't matter how it gets spent. If you buy a car, if you put it in your 401k, you buy a house, you put it in venture capital, no matter where you throw it at the economy, it eventually drifts down into the banking system. And so the banking system basically got $4.5 trillion of new deposits in a year and a half. That's an enormous number, a 35% increase. Now Silicon Valley Bank was the extreme of this, right? Because Silicon Valley Bank basically went from $80 billion in, in deposits to $180 billion. And again, what do you do with it? Because remember, you cannot expand your loan base that rapidly. You just can't. So what did they do? They bought securities because that is what they were required to do. And we all know securities are super safe. <laughs> kind of. Because that's the problem, right? So Silicon Valley Bank picked up something like $70 billion of securities. But then, of course, what happens? The Federal Reserve turns around, cranks up the federal funds rate, which is exactly the same as diminishing the value of all those securities the banks just bought, right? So think of that. So you take a bank like Silicon Valley Bank, suddenly they've lost, I don't know, a few billion on that securities portfolio, which shouldn't be a big deal, except for the fact now with quantitative tightening, deposits are starting to fall and loan demand is still going up. So suddenly a bank's between a rock and a hard place. What do you do? You have two options. You can go to the external markets for extremely expensive financing, or you can start selling your securities at a loss, thus diminishing, diminishing your equity base. So, you know, go to Fed policy. If you go to their website, it says this. The Fed's policy, their ultimate mandate is conducting the nation's monetary policy uh, in, to, in pursuit of full employment and stable prices and then supervising and regulating the bank and other financial institutions. This is what they are supposed to do. Now let's understand what they have done in the last three years. Error number one, in such a violent panic over full employment, they completely blew up price stability, right? Error number one. Error number two, panic over price stability has now negatively impacted the banking system, and they're putting the ranking system between a rock and a hard place. So, you, you've never seen such boneheaded policy coming out of this institution. It just begs the question, what in the hell are they thinking? But of course, this also brings up uh, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite movies of all time, Animal House, I'm not sure if you remember it. Near the end of the movie, you effed up, you trusted us. So, of course, the impact on banking is pretty profound. Yes, banks are cranking down. They're tightening up credit. But it's not because the banking system has a problem. If you look at the loan delinquencies in the commercial banking system today, they have never been lower. Repeat that. Bank loan delinquencies have never been lower than they are right now. The banking system is clean as all get out. So why are they making it hard to get a loan? Because they don't have the money, people. They're getting between the rock and the hard place, which the Fed put them right into. And so credit is getting ground down. Here's the good news for housing. That's not happening in the mortgage markets. They're cranking down in CNI loans. They're cranking down on real estate loans. But actually, they're leaving real estate loans alone. Why? Well, it's Fatty and Freddie, people. It's a different kind of game. It's a different kind of market. So housing is avoiding this problem. But the rest of our economy, not so much. And it's going to be really interesting to see where the Fed goes from here. So the rate response, of course, has been obvious. We talked about it. 30-year fixed rate went from a little over 2% to 7%. Uh, the 10-year bond is up to 4%. And, of course, gravity works. The stock market, which went up wildly, is settling back down to levels they were at pre-pandemic. They're not all the way back, by the way. How's, <laughs> they're still up. P ratios are still elevated. Of course, all those IPOs that have been going off like crazy are cooling off, which is taking some of the ump out of the economy. But again, it's the last two years that are crazy. Of course, uh, venture capital went down a lot. This goes back to the whole conversation about Silicon Valley Bank. Well, part of this is that venture capital is cooling off. Well, yeah, it cooled off from 2021, but 2022 was the best year for venture capital ever, except for 21. It was 30% higher than it was in 2020. These are good numbers. So again, it's just cooling off from insanity. Home prices are down 5% right now, but then again, they went up by 42%. I, again, you gotta remember, 
If you compare asset prices over the last year, they look pretty ugly. If you compare them over the last three years, they still look pretty good. You know, and even this Bitcoin thing, I, I, really? I mean, we still see ramifications of this. Bitcoin was at $60,000 at one point in time. Uh, again, what is the fundamental value of Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies? Zero, 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 no, nothing above zero, <laughs> okay? Simple as that. You don't believe me? P-O-N-Z-I, Italian guy, lived a couple of, a hundred years ago. This is obvious what's going on here. But in this kind of world, even this kind of craziness can take off. <clears throat> as for where the economy is right now, well, yes, the economy has slowed after an incredible 2021. <clears throat> but really, 2022 wasn't all that bad of a year. You're talking about 2% growth. And while, for example, spending on goods was flat, actually spending on services was way up. And consumers actually lifted the economy a lot last year. You had a pullback in spending on structures and residential investment. However, business spending on equipment and intellectual property were still up. It wasn't an economy that was fully contracting. It was a bit of a mixed bag. The big thing, of course, if you, want to think there's going to, if you think there's going to be a recession, first and foremost, focus on the consumer. Where is the consumer going? It's almost 70% of GDP. If the consumer is healthy, they can push the economy through a whole bunch of other trouble. So where is the consumer? Well, they're, they're doing terrible. They're doing, it's a horrible year. How do I know? Well, look, alcohol spending is at an all-time high level. <laughs> Vegas has never seen more gaming revenues. This economy is so bad, it's drinking, driving us to drink and gamble, people, right? Obviously, that's nonsensical. Uh, you know better than that. You know, it's funny, for all the hand-wringing about consumers, have you noticed that re spending at, at restaurants right now is 40% higher than it was pre-pandemic? It didn't just recover, it is 40% higher than it was pre-pandemic. People, uh, external travel from the United States is back to pre-pandemic levels. We're traveling like crazy. You look at hotels around the area, they're doing fine. Ontario airports back to business. Good numbers across the board. And even on the good side, you know, I saw an article in the paper the other day and they're like, auto sales were down 25% from normal. And that article just st stopped. This is miserableism at its heart. Yeah, I know, auto sales are down 25% from normal. How come every auto dealer I know is grinning from ear to ear? Well, that's because their profit margins are up 125%. The problem in autos is not a lack of demand. It's a lack of supply. You know, in a normal year, there are 1.2 million cars for sale. Right now, 118,000. Well, you know, but I, I thought consumers were getting crushed by inflation. Context, please. We've had one year of bad inflation. For all the whining, one year of inflation. That's it. After four years of very low inflation. As for rising interest rates, the vast majority of American consumer debt is in the form of 30-year fixed rate mortgages. The financial obligation ratio is still lower than it has ever been prior to the pandemic. People aren't suffering. Now, those who are telling you that consumers are about to, grow, about to blow away in the wind will go right to the income argument. This is what they're going to say. Oh, well, inflation has pushed real incomes down, and the savings rate's 2%. This isn't sustainable. The consumer's going to collapse. To which I say this has nothing to do with income. This has everything to do with wealth. Even with the pullback in the equity markets, wealth levels are still $30 trillion above where they were pre-pandemic for American households. A mil Thirty. A trillion above, 25%. People are swimming in wealth right now. Uh, and here's a number I, I, I love to death, because this is the number that tells me really everything about consumer demand. Uh, if you look at checkable deposits, that is to say, how much liquid cash households have, in the run-up to the pandemic, people were hanging on to a little over a trillion dollars in just pure liquidity. Right now, five trillion dollars. Pure liquidity, five trillion in checkable deposits. Now, the easy response here, of course, well, that's nice for Jeff Bezos and his buddies. It isn't them. Take a look at, 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 at these are indices of checkable deposits for the bottom 50% and then the top 50%. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's 40 to, uh, 50 to 90%, but same idea. And by the way, uh, they're up for everybody. They're up for everybody. So there's piles of cash out there. And when people have money to spend, they are going to continue to spend the money. 
And as for all these scary debt stories, oh, credit card delinquencies are going up, credit card debt is going up. Yeah, delinquencies are debt are going up. They're going up from the insanely rock bottom low levels we saw in 2021 to almost back to the record low levels we saw in 2019. Hey, you can talk about the change all you want, but if you're not willing to take a step back and look at the levels, well, of course it's gonna look scary. But if you take a look at our own levels, what you realize, the only thing that's happening right now is we are returning to something resembling normalcy. We're not tipping into a recession. And of course, businesses are doing fine, profits are up, uh, high propensity business license applications for the state are still elevated from pre-pandemic. Uh, you look at inventory to sales ratio, still low, bond distress, for all the banking news you've heard, bond distress is incredibly low right now. The big problem for businesses, it's not the people on that side of the counter, it's the people on this side of the counter. I have plenty of customers. It's getting people to service my customers that I'm having a problem with. Job openings rate is still incredibly high. It rose in December after coming down a little bit. And of course, sectors like healthcare, leisure, hospitality. Why don't we have enough workers? Well, we knew this was going to happen. This is demographics. It's been going on for decades. All goes back to the boomers. Boomers all raised in families of 10 kids, all went out and had one kid. There you go, your population pyramid is now a population column. And now every time a boomer retires, you got one Gen Z coming into the workforce, whining and complaining and quiet quitting and moaning and just miserable every single step of the way. Um, you knew this was gonna happen. But of course it took the pandemic, which caused a couple million people to retire. Yes, they retired. It's not long COVID. They're not afraid to work. They don't lack the skills to work. You know, it's funny, I just love the scare stories they try to come up with here. The current population survey asks people, if you're not in labor force anymore, why? And you have a whole variety of answers. And what did the vast majority of people say? I retired. And of course they retired. Their stock market portfolio was at an all-time high level. They were on the edge of retirement anyway, because they were in their early 60s. And oh, by the way, they just refied their house at 2.7%. This is a good time to retire. So, of course, the net result of that is labor markets are incredibly tight, and there are some upsides to that. Not if you're trying to run a business. You can see that on the right-hand side because your cost of your labor is going through the roof. But on the left-hand side, check out real earnings growth, but particularly focus on the bottom half versus the top half. Do you know whose income growth is getting hurt by inflation? The top 50% of workers, not the bottom 50%. The bottom 50% of workers are actually seeing income earnings growth above the pace of inflation. And that's because labor markets have completely flipped things. And you see it out here in the Inland Empire. You take a look at median household incomes, which have been rising sharply, or average weekly earnings, which continue to rise nicely. Again, all signs of tight labor markets, good for the local economy. And of course, it also means that businesses are needing to invest. You know, if you're going, all companies today, you're thinking about it, if I can't get enough people, what do I need to do? Well, you need to invest in labor-saving technology, which is exactly what they're doing. Spending money on software, information processing equipment, research and development, all the important stuff to help us with our labor shortages. But of course, we're still even gonna complain about this, right? Uh, you know, oh, AI's, AI's gonna steal your job, people. AI's gonna steal, bring on the AI. <laughs> We're now in more than ever. It's funny, you talk about narratives. In that book, Narrative Economics, there's a chapter devoted to the Luddite narrative. I just love this. You know, uh, it turns out Luddites have been around way before the real Luddites were. It goes all the way back to the dawn of wheel. That was the first time that people started to complain, don't make these wheels, you know? You're gonna steal our jobs. Then after that, you had all sorts of other crises. You know, printing presses, looms, engines, automations, transistors, robotics, the internet's now stealing our jobs. You, over and over and over again, right? Now AI is coming to steal your job, people. It's the same story over and over and over again. You know what's sad about this whole thing? You know, we always worried about the AI stealing the jobs we want to have. What you really need to think about is, is, is can AI take the jobs we, we don't want to have? Well, there's a news article I saw yesterday that kind of disturbed me on that front. Snapchat tried to make a, a, a safe AI for teens. Uh, it failed miserably. The AI started talking about drugs and sex with the teenagers. So it turns out AI 
is no better parent of teenager than you are. So we can all be rest assured that this is one lousy job we all have to continue to have. So who's ahead, who's behind? Uh, again, kind of an irrelevant question. Uh, we always have to talk about, you know, which economy is strong and which one's weak and where are headquarters moving and why are they moving? And, you know, we have to deal with our governor and the Texas governor, you know, talking about how big their economies are. And it, it just goes on and on and on. But, you know, one thing that every part of this nation has in common right now, you know, I don't care if you're red or blue, rural or urban, if you're coastal or inland, Every part of our nation right now has more job openings than they did a few years ago. This is the one thing we all share in, our labor shortage problems. Now, they are a little worse in some places than others. Alaska's job shortage is 10% right now. California is 6.5. That's up 2.2 percentage points. What's interesting is look at Arizona, which is growing like crazy. They have a 7% job earnings weight, but it's only up 1.7%. And you start to realize there's something odd happening because I see all the fast-growing states on the right and the slow-growing states on the left, and you ask, what's going on? Well, the answer, of course, is that this is nothing but labor force availability. Jobs, jobs, jobs is ancient. That doesn't matter anymore. Now it's about workforce. This is what's really important. And if you really want to talk about what's happening in California, we just got above our pre-pandemic level of overall jobs, but just. It doesn't mean there isn't labor demand. Job openings is 50% higher than it was pre-pandemic. The problem here is we don't have the workers to hire. And sectors like leisure, hospitality, government, and other services are at the bottom of the chain. People have taken jobs in other parts of the economy, and now they're struggling to fill their, fill their ranks. And there's just nobody to hire. So, you know, just take a look at California versus Washington. Why do they grow and we don't? Well, they have labor force growth and we don't. It's as simple as that. No more, no less. So if you think about California, you want to know what our biggest problem is? It's not our business climate. It's the fact that we're going to have zero growth in people in their prime working condition. Now, by the way, none of this is being an apology for the nonsense that goes on in Sacramento. You want to talk about broken narratives? But at the same time, if you take a step back, you recognize the bigger problem in California right now, not what they're going to do, but right now is, again, there's nobody to hire, and that's not going to change. We have to focus on this. And so the Texas versus California thing, if you really want to know why Texas grows faster than California, there's only one data point you need. That's right here on the left-hand side. That's housing permits. That's it. There's your entire story in a nutshell. Everything else is second order. This is the only thing that matters. They build housing and we don't. And by the way, right now, because of the trends in housing, California housing vacancy has never been lower than it is right now. There is nothing available. And if you look across California, it's a very similar sort of picture. The places that have had labor force growth have job growth. Who has labor force growth? Stockton, the Inland Empire, Visalia, Sacramento, Fresno. It's not till you get to San Jose do you see one of your major coastal economies on that particular list. Why? Well, first of all, along the coast, a lot more retirements. You also had a bunch of people leaving the coast because tourism got hammered and moving inland to take jobs. By the way, they're not moving back. And the net result is the inland parts of the state are able to grow which is why they're growing. And the coastal parts of the state are choking on their unwillingness to build enough housing. And of course, if you look at Southern California labor market, you want to just compare Los Angeles to the Inland Empire, the unemployment rate in the Inland Empire right now is lower than it is in Los Angeles. Lower. Think of that number just for a second. Uh, overall, uh, payroll jobs over the past decade, the Inland Empire has grown 45%. But again, why? Well, it's because the labor force has grown tremendously, whereas in L.A., it's still below where it was prior to the pandemic. Again, the fear, sheer force of labor force growth is one of the most important drivers of local economic growth. And if you look at the jobs out here, well, again, uh, lots of jobs, uh, of course, overall in the last uh, uh, five years or so, about a little over 120,000 jobs. Uh, top of the list, logistics. Logistics, prior to the pandemic, logistics added a phenomenal number of jobs, 25% of all jobs. In the pandemic, 75% of all jobs in the Inland Empire were in the logistics industry. Now, by the way, there's lots of other good jobs out there, too. Healthcare, leisure and hospitality has actually bounced back in here, unlike other parts. Construction is obviously doing okay. So, yeah, there's some good numbers. But it is interesting. You think about that logistics sector and how well it's done. And by the way, you can see one of the sources 
of, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, economic success. But take a look at taxable sales on the right-hand side. You can see overall consumer, uh, uh, consumer spending, taxable sales, is up a bit from pre-pandemic. That, of course, is driven by the fact that consumers out here are doing very well. Their incomes are up, they have plenty of job opportunities, and they're spending that money. On the other hand, take a look at stuff coming out of business activity. Those are your warehouses, and it's through the roof, and it's pouring tons of money into the coffers out here, and it's giving a big lift to a lot of local governments. So if you take a look at some of the numbers out here, well, again, warehouse is the darling. Office, though, you know, we hear lots of scare stories about office space in L.A. and, and uh, 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 San Francisco. It's worth noting that office vacancies are down in the Inland Empire, not up. You're not seeing those problems. So in a lot of ways, even the non-residential part of the economy out here is doing pretty good. Now, is industrial due for a big collapse? I don't think so. I don't think so. Really, what we did was we, uh, we ushered in the new era much more rapidly. And the new era, of course, is us not going to the store, but the store coming to us in the form of deliveries. And you know, we know about the e-commerce share of retail, but I love this Pitney Bowes number. Uh, there were 11 billion packages delivered in 2016, 20 billion in 2020. In 2021, 21.6 billion packages delivered, twice as much as six years early. Now, you wonder why these warehouses are coming up all over the place. Now, to be clear, how far can this go? Well, way over in the end, it's a little hard to see, but that 21.6 billion is about 166 packages per household per year. Now, mind you, my house, we get that per month, okay? So there's a lot of room for expansion in this particular part of the delivery system. So yeah, I don't think it's a bubble as the case may be. With that in mind, of course, non-residential permits out here actually barely budge despite all the chaos you're seeing, and yes, even some of this is a commercial. Now, I will tell you, one of the interesting things that's been going on, of course, is suddenly there is a big war being declared against industrial. It's an interesting point. Um, to me, I don't think this is very good. First of all, I don't think we should have knee-jerk reactions to industries, particularly ones that have been so important for the development of the Inland Empire. With that in mind, it probably was petering on anyway. You know, it's interesting, but the Inland Empire's industrial base is now the size of LA's. And one of the big issues, I already showed that, the unemployment rate in the Inland Empire is now lower in Los Angeles. A lot of the industrial guys, their biggest issue is they can't find anybody to hire. So they're kind of already looking to field at some level. Nevertheless, uh, this is the wrong reaction, but I'm not so worried about it as the case may be. <clears throat> now, of course, with all this good news for the Inland Empire, this is the rhetoric you hear, uh, talking about how tragic the IE is a couple of years ago. There's a big op-ed, which I talked a lot about, how the governor's going to come and save the Inland Empire from its dreary, exhausted, you know, uh, dismal existence. This, this is the kind of stuff that makes me absolutely crazy. Um, look, no matter how you look at it, if you actually control for levels of education, people in the Inland Empire make as much as any place along the coast once you control for the level of education. And by the way, they spend a third less on housing. So no matter how you look at it, Quality of life in the Inland Empire is better than any place else in the Inland Empire. It's a different kind of economy than San Jose, but that doesn't mean it's a bad economy. It means it's a different kind of economy. And if you look at the numbers, how well the residents are doing, take a look at share of the local population that subprime credit scores. It was 45% after the Great Recession. Today, by the way, it's back down to 25% population out here is doing great. Income inequality is some of the lowest out here across all of California. What you're dealing with is one of the most successful middle-class economies in the nation. And it's amazing to me that the folks in Sacramento can't seem to understand that. So with all that in mind, the biggest issue yet again is a function of declining population and how it's putting stress. So what's going on, on that particular front? Well, look, the one thing I've talked about year after year, the biggest problem the Inland Empire has, it has picked up some of the bad habits, that is to say, of constraining housing supply growth. And as a result of that, yes, suddenly the Inland Empire is looking a little bit more like the coastal communities. Inasmuch as you're starting to have gentrification, you're starting to have out-migration to people, and of course home prices are being driven up by the fact that really lower-income people are the ones that are leaving, and the prices are simply re to the new population. Housing, housing, housing is the biggest key, is the biggest key to continued successful growth in the Inland Empire, and despite all the efforts of the governor, they really haven't changed the equilibrium. You can see the numbers in 2022 were basically the same numbers as 2017, and still a pale shadow of where they were in 06 and 07. What about housing, though? 
Can housing actually survive in this particular atmosphere? Again, more scare stories out there. For example, existing home sales in the U.S. have completely collapsed. The case Schiller shows us prices are now falling. Uh, you have, of course, a big inventory of new homes for sale. Single-family housing starts are starting to fall. Not a good thing. Uh, but take a step back, because this is not the Great Recession at any stretch of the imagination. First of all, we understand that the, the relationship between this cycle and last cycle is really is only on one basis, and that is, of course, the enormous increase in prices. Now, the Great Recession saw, of course, those home prices coming up over about three or four years. In, in this case, in this quantitative easing bubble, uh, you've seen home prices come up uh, even more rapidly. 40% overall, if you look at the case show numbers for Los Angeles, about 38% increase in, in, in prices. So both episodes started with a big hike in prices. But back then, everything started to fall apart because of foreclosures. This time, it's all because of the big hike in interest rates. Interest rates going from 25 to 7%. Remember, at the wake of the Great Recession, after the re Great Recession happened, interest rates came down sharply, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter, because the rot in housing was horrendous. This time around, it's completely interest rates, which of course is driving that annual payment on your mortgage up tremendously. Suddenly buying power is down, and the market has to refigure itself out. On the other hand, is this going to be a wipeout? Absolutely not. Remember, the real problem in housing back before the Great Recession was in a huge new flow of subprime debt into the market, bad quality, huge quantities of debt that created frenetic speculation, and of course, the oversupply problem. We don't have any of those problems. The debt markets have been very constrained by Dodd-Franks. Overall, of course, uh, the cleanest, cleanest uh, uh, mortgage market we've ever seen from a, just a FICO score situation, and this is a cash-driven bubble. It's a cash-driven bubble, not a debt-driven. Think about what happened. If you look at, for example, debt to equity ratios, the amount of equity in the overall U.S. housing market, prior to the pandemic, I'm sorry, Great Recession, debt equity hit about 15 trillion, but that was only adding, after about adding six or seven trillion dollars of mostly bad debt to the market. This time around, equity has gone through the roof with almost no increase in debt. We have one of the lowest debt to equity ratios ever, and to give you a sense of equity, Overall equity in the U.S. housing market right now is $30 trillion. $30 trillion, three times what it was a decade ago. I mean, it's crazy how thick this market is with just equity. And of course, if you actually look at supply, tightest housing market we've ever seen. Month supply of existing homes, incredibly low. Vacant homes for sale, incredibly low. Overall housing vacancies, the lowest they've ever been. I mean, one of the big issues here, one of the big questions is, what happened to the housing? Because there's nothing out there. No matter how you look at it, there's an incredibly short supply of housing. Well, there's two things that happen. It's almost like the, pop, it's almost like the labor shortage problem. It's short and long run. The long run had to do with miserableism. We have to remember housing developers are the, they, they are the, they are the uh, uh, biggest example of what I call a manic depressives in our economy. Right? Housing developers, when times are good, everything's great. When things, times aren't good, everything's the worst ever, right? This is how the industry operates. And what that means is typically during expansions, developers overdo it and they build too much housing. Not this last time. We had one of the weakest expansions for housing supply ever. And the only explanation I have for that is miserableism. But then, of course, over the course of the pandemic, something else happened. And something no one really likes to talk about. But it works this way. There was a secular jump in household creation, which is a fancy way of saying that when we were all stuck living together, a bunch of us realized we didn't like the people we were living with. And that ended up absorbing about one and a half million empty units overnight. So now you have an insanely tight housing market with tons of equity. This is not going to implode. If you look at overall prices in the Inland Empire, and this is where the numbers get crazy. This is through the end of the year. They've barely come down. For all the huge increase, prices have just started to come down. And here's some other data. Uh, this is inventories, units for sale through the beginning of the year. Look how there's almost no, nothing available out there. There's just nothing available. Inventories are substantially tighter now than they were in 2018. Overall listing prices, well, days on market have bounced up basically to where they were in 2019. And as for, as for a listing prices, uh, they barely come down. There, nobody 
Nobody's capitulating in this market. They're like, eh, you don't like my price? Don't buy it. And that is the critical part of this market. Well, what was wrong with the housing market in 2010? were not enough buyers. What's wrong with the housing market in 2023? Not enough sellers. The collapse of filtering. You know, in housing, what we say is you build at the top to supply at the bottom. Why? You build a bunch of fancy units. These people move here. These people move here. These people move here. And that creates supply at the bottom. Well, here's the problem. People aren't moving up. Who's going to sell their house at a 2.5% mortgage rate, move down the street to a fancy new home at a 7%? You're not going to do that. And so, oddly enough, this situation is going to make the supply crisis worse, which yet again means even fewer sellers. And of course, that also explains why apartments are so hot right now. Think of all the people who would like to buy a house. There's nothing available. So apartments, you are in. Vacancy rates are down. Rents are up. Starts for five-unit buildings, up sharply. One of the greatest years for expansion in this supply. And if you look out here in Southern California, sharp increase in rents, overall vacancy rates are down. Again, this only makes sense. This is where people are ending up until, of course, the housing market figures it out. But of course, what's interesting here is we are discussing this as if it's some sort of huge problem for renters. They look at rent growth and they say, oh, this is terrible for renters. We need rent control. We need to get rid of cost of Hawkins. We need more, all this and all this stuff. But the narrative is completely wrong. Look, apartments are one of the most competitive markets we have. The only way the prices go up dramatically is if you have a sharp decline in supply or a sharp increase in demand. As far as I know, we haven't seen a sharp decline in supply of apartments in the last few years. Ergo, this is all about demand. And if you actually look at affordability, what's amazing is from 2018 to 2021, the number of housing cost constrained households in California has fallen. It's not gone up. For all the increase in prices and all the increase in rents, housing affordability looks better now than it did in 2018. This is not the issue, but what's scary is the narrative is it is an issue, and the policies they're pursuing to help affordability are ultimately going to make the supply problem worse. We have a supply problem, not an affordability problem, and someone really needs that to get that in the head of a lot of political policymakers in the state. So, what does this all mean? How do we wrap this all up? Well, look, the expansion's clearly going to continue. Wealth and income will drive consumer spending. Business spending will offset labor shortages. <coughs> Asset values are going to fall. Liquidity is driving up. Inflation's going to run hot. But I think rates are going to start settling down. Here's the good news. Here's the good news about the banking crisis. I know it sounds weird. How can it be good news? Well, remember, you've really put Jerome Powell between a rock and a hard place. What are you going to do? Are you going to flight inflation and crush the banking system? Or are you going to take the pressure off the banking system and allow inflation to run? Well, if you take the pressure off the banking system, yes, you'll allow inflation to run, but that's good for housing. That's good for housing. Because A, it'll allow mortgage rates to settle out as opposed to getting, can continue to get pushed up. And oh, by the way, it pushes the fundamentals towards where the market price is, which will get it clearing that much faster. So this, the banking crisis is, oddly enough, good news for housing. I get it. Odd, but that's the situation. So my feeling is construction trend will stabilize. As for the Inland Empire in real estate, local economy is one of the hottest in the nation. Residents' incomes are growing rapidly. Labor shortage is your biggest problem. Real estate losing liquidity because it's suffering a lack of, of sellers. Demand for housing, though, will remain high. Yes, the turn on industrial is not a good sign for the economy. It's more of that coastal, shall we say, local policy making that is inevitably going to end up being bad. But I'm not worried because other job trends can fill in the gap. Overall, here's what the region needs. You need state policies that support local growth, not despair of it, right? And unfortunately, the narratives are so broken on that. Potential scenarios, what's the Fed going to do? I think they're going to back off. I think they're going to be forced to by the banking situation. But who knows? As I, already, as I already showed you, the last three years has shown us that the Federal Reserve Board has become completely, completely politicized, and as a result of that, they have lost 100 years of collective wisdom. Just lost it. In a few short, politically extreme years, the Federal Reserve has completely lost their way. Hard for me to say what they're actually going to do next. We have the national local fiscal situations. You've got the Chinese real estate situation. You've got a brittle economy. But the biggest, scariest thing 
remains the gap between economic realities and political narratives. This is still very dangerously wide. So, remember, it's easier to fool people than it is to convince them that they have been fooled. And this, this is the place we live in. So go out, have a good year, understand it's going to be tight liquidity, it's going to be hard to be finding those units to buy and sell, but the market isn't going to implode and things are going to bounce back quicker than most people are going to tell you. So with that, there's my QR code. Get your phone out. Take a quick picture of that. Now, I appreciate there's going to be another economist up here. He's probably going to have a slightly different opinion. There's one thing I just want to tell you. Remember, everything spoken in a German accent sounds a lot scarier, okay? Keep that in mind.